Unpacking Mormonism is a subsidiary of Daisy Girl Communications, LLC. All content herein is intended for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice or counsel of your personal care provider. Hello and welcome to Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma. I told Mason right before we started he has to stop. That's so gross. Stop crunching. He ate an apple. I did start because I realized... I realized it's been a long time since you and I just started with our normal married, ha-ha, banter, <laughs> joking. Like So you we've started been... with me doing something disgusting, quote-unquote, that you just said. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to pick on you, right? It's therapeutic well, marital picking Well, that's true. That on. does feel completely normal, yeah. <laughs> All right, so welcome to Unpacking Mormonism and, and our mini <laughs> series of why Sarah left the church. Yeah, hey, it's good to be here. Good to have you guys here. All right, so our topic today is going to be racism. And um, today's topic and also the one. So, trigger alert we're going to talk about racism. We're content talk about warning. Some of the things, yeah. Not trigger alert. Content, content warning. warning. Yeah, that's, we that's are going to talk about racism. Um, the other thing that I want to make really clear is we've had some emails and messages. You know, are you going to share your opinions on the issues in the church with the LGBTQIA population? And the answer is yes. In fact, our plan was to do that with this mini series because it was definitely something that influenced my decision to leave the church. Um, and one of the things, and I don't know which episode is going to come first. That just depends on what one gets edited fastest and how these things come together. Sometimes I think I know, and then we switch switch it up. But I would say that, and I'll say this when we record the LGBTQIA episode, that for me, the realization of the racism issues and the LGBT issues within the Mormon church somewhat formulated and came to my awareness at the same time. So on the racism and on the LGBT um, series, the, the, the episodes on those, there's going to be a lot of crossover as to when things happened and kind of my own personal and professional development surrounding those, those issues. So, Well, I mean, the issues are incredibly closely related mostly you're dealing with discrimination and yeah, so and marginalized population sure yeah mm -hmm. all that so it makes sense that they would be heavily intertwined um especially with the work that you do well and i think it's really important for my listeners to recognize that for me i a hundred percent believe that our sexuality is something that we're born with it's a part of us it's ingrained in us and I know Mason you're still working through some of that and and that's completely fine but for me one of the reasons these are so closely intertwined is that as far as I'm concerned you have no control over what color your skin is when you're born and you have no control over your sec what we call sexual orientation and so for me and in my field and I would say that the majority of the people in my field also align their thinking with homosexuality or being, I don't know, I'll, I'll say sexually divergent. Um, as I don't even, I, it, it's normal. It's a part of the animal kingdom. It's, it's, we see it across all species and, and whatnot. And so in my field, discriminating and marginalizing and harming people because of something they have no control over is disgusting and wrong. And so these two issues are so closely entangled and enmeshed that kind of pulling them apart for the purposes of this mini series was difficult. But I wanted to separate them because I feel like each issue absolutely 100% deserves its own Podcast. Right. They might be interlinked trees, 
but they're still separate trees. Right. And, and in keeping with the theme that we've tried to hold, I don't have to agree with the way that you see things to be able to respect the way that you see right. things and understand the way that you see things. Yes, I'm still sorting through how I feel about new ideas and new revelations about the LGBTQ community. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't learn to see them in a different way. Right. We um, have to honor and, and different opinions to honor and different them. perspectives. And, you know, instead of, you know, I grew up thinking that they were just living in sin. And instead of that being the first thing that I see, I can throw that piece away and I can look at them and see them as children of God or, or just people, however right. you look at it, and recognize that they have as every bit as much value and worth as I do, and their lifestyle doesn't change that. So do we need to change the topic for today and go into the next one, so. or are we going to stick with racism? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd better drive on with racism, and we'll talk about that on, on a different podcast probably later today. Yeah, for, so for, us, for us anyway. Yeah. For us anyway, we're going to talk about it later today. Um, so yeah. Okay, so... Let's get started. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> my sister gave me feedback and she told me that I need to say um less. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably right. She is right. And I'm still there's, saying there's um. not much place in this forum for the <laughs> word um, but it still happens a lot. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, it's going to keep happening. So I would say that as I look back on my journey in the church with the issue of racism, like most of us, I was very, very naive to the impact racism was having in my church during my period of growth and development. So I was born in 1981, um, which makes me... 41 years old. I am in the prime of my life. So old. I am not old. I am young. Now, when I was in kindergarten, I thought my 23-year-old school teacher was like old and knew everything. So <laughs> age, is, age is relevant. Absolutely. Anyway, so I was really naive. And because I was born in Ray, well, I was born in Provo, Utah, and I was raised in Snowflake, Arizona. And I don't remember if I've said this before on this podcast, um, or the other one, but there was one black family that I knew of in my high school. Um, while I was in elementary school, my dad had a black family or a black student um, that was that was one of my friends, and and she would come over and play with me. Um, and then in Snowflake, there were a few people that were Hispanic or Latino. And then in my hometown, there were a lot of Native Americans. Uh, Snowflake is situated in the northeastern part of the state of Arizona, and it is right between the Navajo and Apache reservations. And so there were a lot of Natives um, that I went to school with um, in in my years growing up. For me, as I was growing up... Um, I had a different experience than a lot of the people in my community with exposure to different ethnicities and races and cultures, because as I've said in the past, my mom was an Air Force brat, and so she traveled all up and down the East Coast mostly for her childhood, and she did her high school years, and then my grandparents retired and settled in upstate New York. Um, and my grandfather was the branch president of the Utica branch um, in New York, and it was the inner city Utica branch. And so when we would go to New York to visit them for the summers, we became the minority in that branch. There were more African-American, Black, Hispanic, Latino, Asian members in that teeny tiny branch than there were white members. And I felt very comfortable with those um friendships and those relationships and my parents were very comfortable with those relationships because again my mom grew up in the air force traveling all over the place and she was raised in a home where uh, my, my grandparents instilled in them to be respectful to all people that they were brothers and sisters in arms that they were serving their country together that was the value system that came to me through my mom which I'm very grateful for 
my dad grew up in LA. And so in LA, um, my dad would have, you know, very comfortable with Hispanic, um, culture. I'm not entirely certain about my dad's experience with the black culture, although my dad was very good at, you know, loving all people. Um, I don't get the feeling that either of my parents were overtly racist in any way. Now, my dad says some really stupid shit on a very regular basis um, about other races. And a lot of that I'm going to say is, you know, the product of the time period that he was raised in. He was born in the late 60s. Um, and so he says a lot of really stupid stuff. Um, <laughs> Can I interject here real quick, too? I think yep. that, um, you know, we're going to talk more in detail about that kind of thing. That's uh-huh. part of this story. Um, Emmanuel Atjo, when he did did his book, um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, talks about the idea of do we call you black? Do we call you African-American? I think right at the beginning here, that we've kind of chosen to say black. There's certainly no offense intended by that. Um, we, I recognize, we recognize that some people prefer black, some people prefer African American. Whatever your preference is, please just understand that we're trying to address the fact that racism exists, how it began in our lives, how we've tried to overcome it, and how it's affected us, and how it exists in Mormonism, Christianity, religion in general. Right, and so. For just the ease of conversation, we've chosen to use that term so that we can address it consistently and try and get to the bigger issues that go on with that. So I just wanted to to kind of start out with that idea of just, you know, we're not trying to offend anybody by using or choosing a term that for some people is offensive and for some people it's not. Well, and I would say we've spent or we spent 20 years in the military and I have several friends who are black. And when I've spoken to them, that is their preferred way to be identified. And so that's what I'm using because I'm, I'm utilizing the term that the people that I'm most closely associated with the, the term and the, the verbiage that they align with and connect with right. most. So Same I, I appreciate me. that clarification. Same for me, but I wanted to Mason. kind of just bring that out at the beginning. Well, and this is a difficult issue because the societal norms and the and the norms within the Mormon church were very much lined up for many generations, for, for several yeah. decades. They were pretty much on the same page. And so it's not ent- been until after the civil rights movement that we're starting to see a separation. And so one of the things that you're going to hear today isn't just my experience of racism within the Mormon church. It's my exposure and experience with racism in general, because I can't really separate this. But it's not like in the, in the general population that we're dealing with polygamy as a regular thing every single day. That's, you know, very right. unique to the Mormon right. church. But when we talk about issues with racism and then issues with the LGBTQIA population, it it, it becomes a lot more muddled. And so I want to make sure that I'm fair to the Mormon church in the sense of I am not saying that all of the things I'm talking about today came from the Mormon church. I recognize sure, that there's a lot yeah. of enmeshment there. Um, so, and Mason, you talked about Emmanuel, it's Acho, right? I believe so. Okay. So Emmanuel Acho's book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Um, is that the name of the book? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the name of the book. He also has a YouTube channel with the same name, which we highly recommend. And we're going to refer to a couple of times as we move forward, mostly because it is probably, in my experience, the most digestible, easy to understand, user-friendly um, resource right now for exposing yourself to a new way of thinking, learning different terminologies. We've utilized his work. We've also got a couple of books um, about anti-racism in our home, like The Anti-Racist Baby. I can't remember the name. It's Ibrahim. I'll find it for you here in a second. You yeah, well, and there's on. there's one for the, like our middle school kids that we had them read that was also about anti-racism. That's all from the same author. Yeah, yeah. Abraham something. So anyway, yeah, yep, Mason, go ahead that. and find that. We'll make sure we link that in the show notes. All right, so anyway, my younger years, I was just very naive, but I was also exposed to a lot more 
ethnic and racial diversity than most of my other peers in Snowflake simply because of my parents, um, the environments that my parents grew up in, and then the fact that we would basically spend one summer in New York and then one summer in L.A. because my dad was a school teacher when I was younger. We visited those two areas and drove across the country on a regular basis. I mean, before I married Mason, I'd already seen the majority of the continental United States just traveling by car all over the country with my family. My family was very um, adventurous in that way, by car. Not, not, not so much into other countries, um, but definitely by car. Go ahead, His Mace. name is Ibram X. Uh, Kendi, K-E-N-D-I. Okay, and his, he's got the anti-racist baby. What's the other one that's more for like the middle it's, school... It, they're all basically called the same thing, and I don't know that for sure. I'll put it in the show notes so that okay. you're aware of that. Also, thank he you. Had, he had, I think, two different podcasts with um, Brene, Brown. Brene Brown, but I'm, I'm linking you to the first one, and okay. then also I'll try and pull up some of those well, books. Well, there was that book that our daughter Katie read. Was it called Stamped, I think? Anyway, we'll, we will link some of these resources. Um, we're not verbally getting them correct right now because it's just coming up hello organic conversation (laughs) but we will link a lot of those books into the show notes because they've been phenomenal resources to help our children be exposed to some of the issues that are still going on in our society today well here we are two white people talking about racism and the experiences that we've had and so we have naturally in that process had to reach out to other resources because We've seen some of it. And as we go through your story, you, you, the listener, will hear some of that as well. But if we want to overcome something as vast and deep-rooted as racism, mm-hmm. we have to be able to see it from the perspectives of all different people in all different walks of life. Right. Um, Emmanuel Acho says, you know, I'm, I'm black and I've had to deal with a lot of this racism, but I'm also a very well-educated, almost privileged black. And right. so the story is different from every walk of life. And so we've had to put ourselves out there and try and digest some of this material mm-hmm. so that we can, as, as uh, Mr. Kendi puts it, become anti-racist. In other words, we're fighting against right. racism. We're consciously, we're consciously fighting, fighting against, against it rather racism. than just being complacent about it, which is mm-hmm. kind of how I feel the church the, the, the Mormon church is right now is they're just kind of complacent about it. Well, see, and oh, sorry, I interrupted but, you. So, Go ahead. like, um, and I, we're probably going to get into this later, but because there's the church is now a worldwide church, it's almost like, well, we're just not going to talk about that. We have all these, all these members of all kinds of different races, so obviously it couldn't exist in our, our membership. And I just think that that's not, it's a very ignorant way to look at the situation. I would disagree with you a little bit on some of the complacency. Like, I'm going to agree with that statement. We'll say 80%. But I kind of feel like the church has also, like, and when I say the church, I mean the leadership, the organization, not the individual people, because the individual people are all at a different place in life when it comes to the issue of racism. But, you know, both of us, Mason, have families that when we talk to them about our concerns with racism, both your family and my family are like, why are you even talking about this? This doesn't exist. Like, what's the big deal? Knock it off. And when we call out the LDS church and say, LDS church, y'all need to apologize for your racist past. This is not okay. You've got to be able to acknowledge that mistakes were made and that prophet said some really shitty things. You know, the environment in both of our families of origin is that's in the past, leave it alone, move on, ignore it, and so is the churches. And I don't think that that's complacency as much as that is actively denying that it exists. And I I think that there's there's a difference. I would say for a lot of years, for me, I was complacent in that I didn't know what I didn't know, but I also didn't put any effort into figuring it out. 
And what's different now about the church is that they didn't know what they didn't know. And today they're actively claiming that they don't understand it, nor are they going to apologize for it, despite the fact that we have different information. This is, you have different information, and the church is like, put on my blindfold, I'm going to ignore this on purpose. It's like they are actively avoiding the conversation now. Yeah. And that's a little different for me than complacency. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, good. So, I'm glad you agree with me, because if you don't, I'm going to throw my pen at your head. So... I said that makes sense. I didn't say I agreed with you. They're so two different you, issues. Do you agree with me? Um, an attitude I of complacency and an attitude of active avoidance? Yes, I think that those are absolutely different things. I'm not sure I agree that that's what's going on in the church ranks okay. or in the leadership of the church. But I think that we'll probably discuss that a little bit more as we get deeper into this conversation. Oh, we will. And I'd, and I'd Tonight, like to... we're going to argue about it <laughs> and get passionate. I didn't mean you and, and me at home. I'm when the microphone sl- gets turned off. <laughs> I... <laughs> oh, dang it. All right. But what I mean is we should probably get back to your story because yeah. we're going to get deeper into this stuff. And I'd like to... I'd like to start with your story again. Let's get through what you have to share, and then we can discuss it a little bit more in depth. Are you saying I that think we squirreled? I got us side railed. You but squirreled. I, I don't. I don't want to continue down that path. You squirreled. Point at me all you want. It doesn't make any I'm difference. I'm gonna throw it this doesn't affect fidget me. toy at your head. Oh, good catch. <laughs> Ooh, good catch back. Okay, <laughs> so the first time that I remember being consciously aware of the racism issue in the church, I would have probably been, uh, I'm going to say a fresh, not a freshman, because freshman was Old Testament, either a sophomore or a junior in high school, um, because that was the year that we studied the Doctrine and Covenants in seminary, and we're studying section 132. And one of the things that happened in my release time seminary class, so I did seminary as part of my regular high school day because there were enough Mormons and Snowflake for two seminary buildings, even though we only had one. There were four classrooms in our seminary building, and as far as I know, those classrooms were filled all seven or eight class periods of the day. Um, And then there was a large group of students that hung out in those buildings on off time and and whatnot. So it was a very active seminary in Snowflake. And um, my seminary teachers did uh, quotes in the margins of your scriptures. And so we would come into class and they had these dry erase boards that like, I think they ended up with four different chalkboards and they were on these slidey things so they would like slide them around oh, yeah, gotta for, have lots of chalkboards. oh my goodness yeah. well dry erase boards and so we would walk in and there would be a list of quotes in the margin that quotes on the board that we were supposed to then write into our scriptures and so if you look at my seminary scriptures there's not a single page in there that's not marked in some way, like my, my seminary scriptures are heavily marked. And there was almost this sense that the more marked your scriptures were, the more righteous you were. And actually, squirrel, Sarah's squirrel's coming out. I remember when we were in a stake conference. I don't remember if it was stake conference or the stake women's meeting at a stake conference in El Paso, Mason, after I got disfellowshipped. Our stake president because I was, I had my seminary scripture still, and when I was going through the repentance process um, in 2004, after my affair, um, I opened up those scriptures, and the stake president was just shocked and actually commented on Sister Westbrook's scriptures at this meeting, and I absolutely loved that little bit of attention, if that tells you a little bit about where my brain space was at that time. But it was that assumption that because my scriptures were so marked up, I was a more diligent scripture studier than other people and that's actually the quotes in the margins and the marking was something that I also did for my seminary students for the five years that I taught early morning seminary it's Um, it's a good thing to do it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a great scriptorian right right well especially if I'm just copying copying stuff down that the teacher told me to copy and then I never go back and look at it but I remember there was a quote and I don't remember which one it is but for our because I don't have my seminary scriptures here Mason was very kind and looked at me and said you need to bring those back here and I was like yeah I really do don't I so anyway but we did find a quote that was similar so I've got a quote 
It's either this one or something very similar by Boyd K. Packer that went into my scripture margins that day in seminary, and it really bothered me. Mason, can you share what that quote is? Yeah, so I just I found it just by a, via Wikipedia, <laughs> <laughs> but I just looked it up too, and I it's from I think it's January. It is from January of 1977. It's a BYU speech, and Boyd K. Packer says this. We've always counseled in the church for our Mexican members to marry Mexicans, our Japanese members to marry Japanese, our Caucasians to marry Caucasians, our Polynesian members to marry Polynesians. The council has been wise. Yeah, that's bullshit. But that is what it said. And so it it wasn't, I don't think it was that direct quote, but that quote kind of illustrates it's quote unquote, always been taught. And so I have some quote in my margins from conference that says whites marry whites and blacks marry blacks. And then we had a lesson that interracial marriage was bad. Like it was this evil, it was a sinful thing. And if I remember correctly, the reasoning that was given was that when we participated in interracial marriage, we were muddying the lineage of... The 12 tribes of Israel? Yes, thank you. The 12 I was like, the lineage of Abraham? No, that's not what it's called. The 12 tribes of Israel, which didn't make any sense to me because we talked about being adopted into it anyway, especially since. Yeah, especially since all those kiddos came from what? One daddy? So. Well, and I'd like, I think if I could interject too, we've we've spent many of these podcasts talking about implied messages. Right. Um, And. I can understand, like, if you go into a marriage and you have an active Catholic marrying a Muslim, you you could be creating a lot of internal issues because maybe you're not ready to deal with those things. It doesn't mean you can't. It just means if you come in ignorant of the fact that these are probably going to be some fighting right. points, you're you're going to struggle. Um, and so same with races. If you, if you have a, a white guy from Snowflake, Arizona that marries a, a black woman from Algeria, you're going to end up with some I some thought you were going to say Alabama, and I no. was all, you're going to have some cultural <laughs> shock either way, south to Arizona. Right. I, and I want the extreme <laughs> example, right? This right. small town white boy from Arizona with this black woman from Algeria you're going to end up with some cultural struggles. If you go into the marriage ignorant of those things, you're really going to struggle. If you go into the marriage thinking, I love this person, and I know there's some cultural difference, we're going to work through that, we're going to see a counselor, whatever you need to do so you can get through it, okay, fine. So the statement in and of itself might be alluding to the fact that you're asking for trouble if you're not prepared but the implied message has been taken so much further than that. It is used as basis for racism. And well, that's, the tr- that's the problem we have with it. If So we don't really know. You know you're talking about implied meaning. Right. I don't say, know what he meant. All I know is the way it's been taken. Well, and I'm going to say, you know, for me, I remember being taught that it would confuse the lineage and that that was sinful. For you, you're taking it as it's going to introduce issues into a marriage that you now need help with. If I carry the way that you interpreted this a little bit further, there does seem to be this idea in the church that you want to marry somebody that you're not going to have a lot of conflict with. Like there's this expectation that conflict is supposed to be avoided, and that's not healthy. I, I mean, in my field... Couples who avoid conflict tend to have some pretty significant issues that will yeah. eventually blow up and bite them in the arse. Well, for me, it was always, you're going to have conflict in a marriage anyway, so why why add more? Right. Yeah. So. Um, once again, I think we're derailed a little bit. So back to my story. I was frustrated at the time, um, but I also didn't put a whole lot of thought into it I just very like when it comes to quotes in my margin I there's a handful of them that I remember very clearly and this is the one that I remember very clearly for a negative reason like this is one of the ones that for me it felt icky at the time and I didn't want to write it in my scriptures because it did bother me so much but I wrote it in there anyway because on our seminary tests 
it would ask us on some of our tests in those classes, you know, who said blah, 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 you know, um, hint, section 132 of the Darker Covenants. And so I didn't want to get the question wrong on the test, but I also didn't like this idea. And I think the reason I didn't like that idea at all was because I'd been to upstate, you know, upstate, you know, exposure, upstate yeah. New York and in the inner city Utica branch, I'd spent a couple of summers there with my grandpa as the branch president as a youth helping to teach seminary or not seminary primary and, you know, the leaders and, and, and like running around with friends who were black and, and hanging out together in, right. in Utica doing youth activities and whatnot. And I saw a lot of interracial relationships that were my age, that were older. Again, there was also the one black family in my high school. Um, one of the sons of that family was my age and he was the mascot for our cheerleading squad. So, you know, you got a bunch of white girls and this one biracial um, boy who, I mean, we were a team. We did all kinds of things together. And it, it just this, I hated, hated this quote, but I wrote it in my scriptures anyway, because I didn't want to get a question wrong right. on my test, which is disgusting. But then I forgot about it because I was a teenager. And let's face it, developmentally speaking, the world was revolving around me <laughs> and I was good at that. Like most teenage girls are like, you know, okay. It made me upset for a day. I probably thought about it once or twice. If it came up again, I was like, Ugh, that's icky. When we went back and forth or referenced it and I saw it again, I'd be like, Ugh, that's so stupid. And then we, I would just keep going and, you know, distracto. And I have ADHD. If you haven't noticed squirrel, um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, I didn't really start thinking about this issue again until after I became sexually active in high school. Um, my parents responded uh, when I was six. So I was a sophomore when I had my first sexual experience in high school. Um, it, you know, I had sex. Okay. So I, don't, I won't, <laughs> we'll just, we'll just say like it is right after I turned 16, I had sex with my boyfriend my parents freaked out. They pulled me out of school for a little while. For more information, read my upcoming book on all the hell that broke loose there. Um, but after that experience, um, my dad went to California to work for his dad uh, for the summer that year, and we did not join him. Um, I was working at Ed's IGA in Snowflake, Arizona, and a young returned missionary uh, came through my checkout line. Um, he was Native American, and he started crushing on me. Now, I want to point out, I was 16, and he was 21, and I was allowed to date him because he was a returned missionary. Um, I cannot even imagine allowing my 16-year-old daughter to date a 20-year-old man, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Mormon weirdness 101. Okay. So anyway, my um, in my book, his name is Curtis, and I'm going to stick with that name, Curtis. Uh, Kurt and I, there, it's, it's kind of an interesting relationship. I was in a place where I wasn't really looking for a, a boyfriend. I was still very much in love with Michael at the time. There had been a lot of trauma um, in high school at that point. But there was more than just friendship, but it was kind of more flirty. It's kind of hard to describe what Curtis and I shared, but my dad hated him. And the reason that my dad hated him was because he was a Native American, which meant he was dirty and lazy. Now, according to my dad. Now, this was the first time in my life that I can remember my dad saying something that I would consider overtly racist. Um, and that was really a difficult thing because again, Snowflake is situated right between the Apache and Navajo reservations. And so we're talking about a large population of individuals in our community that my dad can be referring to. The other reason that my dad didn't like him is that his best friend, who 
for the record, is now in jail in Utah, um, had been serving in the bishopric of Curtis's ward and had apparently disclosed some things that should have been kept confidential within the bishopric about some of the struggles that Curtis's family had had. And my dad was like, absolutely not. I don't like him. You're not dating my daughter, blah, blah, blah. But he was in California and my mom was happy to release me from my literal imprisonment in my own home when I was 16. And I was just grateful to have a friend again because after my parents pulled me out of high school, I lost my relationships. And we've, we've talked about that. We talked about that with the episode that my dear friend Zoe came on. I just vanished from school and my dad had called my friend's parents and yelled at them for being such terrible examples to me. And so there was a lot of loss for me going on at this time. So this would have been the summer between my sophomore and junior year of high school. I was 16 years old and Curtis taught me how to repel and Curtis was my friend. And, um, I went for a little while ultra Mormon, like in order to keep my freedom after my imprisonment, I had to be the best, most perfect person on the planet to earn my freedoms back. And so what that looked like was instead of listening to regular music, I played hymns all the time. On Sundays, I stayed in my Sunday dress all day on Sunday. Um, every fast and testimony meeting, I was up on the stand bearing my testimony of the truthfulness of the Mormon church, not because that's what I believed, but because that was what I felt like I had to do in order for my parents to say, okay, she's repented. She can go back to school as right. long as there are no Michael family members still in the school. So in my book, Michael is Michael Tobin. So as long as there's no Tobin brothers, no Michael Tobin no more of that. Sarah can go back to school because we can trust her because she wears dresses on Sundays. She listens to hymns. I quit the cheer squad so that way I wasn't in short skirts anymore, which devastated me. Again, for more information, read my upcoming read my upcoming book. Um, Curtis was never an option for me to be able to have a long-term relationship with. So even if there had been something there, number one, I... I Oh, we danced as, as I was getting older and closer to graduation. I think that we both maybe wanted something to be there, but it got derailed fairly quickly because one, my dad didn't like him. So it didn't matter what we did. My dad was constantly criticizing him. And then number two, I did my junior and senior year of high school. I combined them that junior year and I graduated a year early and I started at the local community college and I met a white boy named Mason Westbrook. <laughs> and now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> hey, we used to listen to Paul Harvey almost every morning total, over breakfast. Total squirrel. Total squirrel. I was on Spotify the other day. Okay. And there is a Spotify channel now that has all of the rest of the stories. From Paul Harvey? There, from Paul Harvey. <laughs> like they're three minute little blips. I listened to like 30 of them the other day. <laughs> But there they are. I loved it. I listened That's to it awesome. too. Yeah, it was great. My dad, my dad, well, no wonder my dad liked you. He liked you because... <laughs> he didn't even know all the reasons right. he should like me. He liked you because you served your mission in Boston, which is where he served his. You hated the color green. And if we were still speaking, you loved Paul Harvey. So I guess you're good. Like you are a mar you are marriageable material. No, y'all may think I'm kidding. I am not kidding the reason that mason met the mark of people that i was dating was returned missionary served in boston didn't like the color green he's good enough for my daughter okay <laughs> my dad has issues all right moving moving right along so because because i there was no chance of me getting into any kind of a more serious relationship with curtis like we went to homecoming at byu we shared some almost dating type <laughs> experiences and then the life just led us on different paths. I no longer was concerned about this racist issue as to whether or not I was sinning by marrying somebody who was a native American. Um, it just, it just didn't matter anymore. And again, <laughs> developmental level, I'm 18 years old when I'm marrying Mason. That means my frontal cortex is still all about me and the world is still revolving all around me and I'm loud and I am craving attention from anybody who will give it to me, which really interfered with my relationships with your family 
because they could not understand that my need for unconditional acceptance, no matter what I was doing, was so deep as a yeah. as a trauma response. So I just didn't I just didn't think about it again. And then Mason joined the military. And one of the things that we love about the military is the diversity. Like it is one of the greatest things about the military. Yeah. And Mason, uh, shortly after we joined the military, you shared a Mark Twain quote with me. Do you want to go ahead and, and share that? Sure. Um, so this is from the uh, Innocence Abroad Roughing It. I'm not sure what that is, but that's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> By Mark Twain. But as Mark Twain, he says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Love it. Yeah. And so early in our marriages where, I mean, we had gone to Georgia, San Antonio, Washington State, and then El Paso, Texas. And somewhere in that, we were talking about how travel had really opened our eyes. I mean, the culture in the South, very different, as I was saying earlier, very different than the culture in Arizona, sure. very different from the culture in the Northeast, Pacific Northeast. I mean, we, we were just loving that. And because I had friends from all cultural and, and racial backgrounds, and because Mark Twain said that really cool quote, Again, guys, be nice to me. I was in my early 20s. <laughs> I was cured of racism. Because <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you remember at the very beginning when I said I was so naive? Okay, this is me telling you how naive I was. <laughs> well, then we want to we laugh about it, right? Because right. If, we can, if we can understand and kind of laugh at ourselves, it gives us room to improve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so... Uh, you know, much like my dad at this point, I was probably saying some really stupid things that were hurtful to many of my, who I considered some of my closest friends, but I was doing it innocently. And this is something that Emmanuel Acho, he's, yep. he talks about, is it implicit bias? Yes. Can yeah. you explain what that means, Mason? So according to Emmanuel Acho, because I don't want to, you know, I think I he may have coined this term, but I'm not positive. He, he, he may have. I don't know. But what he explains is that implicit bias is racist actions that are generally undertaken unconsciously. Right. So that was the world I was in. It was not meant to be harmful. But right. I wasn't making a conscious effort to challenge any of that. And... I mean, I was disgusted by some things that were said overtly to me in the church. Like, at one point, I was, you know, again, military moving all the time, and I struggled with infertility, and we wanted to get pregnant. And so I asked, you know, my friends at church, hey, I need a good OBGYN for infertility. TRICARE sent me to, and I'm just going to name the doctor, Dr. Black. Um, because he was black and I didn't know it at the time. And so I said, hey, you know, TRICARE has sent me this referral for infertility treatments to Dr. Black. And one of my white friends was like, oh, you don't want to see Dr. Black. And I was like, well, why not? And they said, well, because he's black. And I remember being like, um, okay. Subsequently, Dr. Black was not certified in the type of treatment I would need, I don't think. So I ended up seeing a different doctor who was white. But I did end up seeing, so we'll call that one Dr. White, right? I saw, I saw Dr. White sure, why not? for the infertility treatments <laughs> in order to get things done. But then I did go back and see Dr. Black for some other GYN issues. And it didn't bother me at all. And after that, because I remember thinking, you know, he was very gentle, he was very professional, he was very knowledgeable. He actually took a lot more time and seemed more intentional in explaining to me what was what was going on for me um, from a medical standpoint than Dr. White had. He took time with me. And I remember leaving that and thinking, why didn't Sister So-and-so, we'll call her Sister Prejudice, why didn't Sister Prejudice... Um, <laughs> What was her issue with Dr. Black other than the fact that he's black and that I remember getting online and, and looking up some statistics and being absolutely floored yeah. that male African-American doctors have a harder time establishing clientele in populations that are not, you know, 
racially diverse be and it's and it's assumed that that is because of their race and I was just floored because Dr. Black was incredibly professional um I had you know Dr. Tai that's at her actual name who is a an Asian woman who delivered my daughter Katie absolutely incredible like I mean it, it, for for me it's about your qualifications, your education, your skill as a provider. And so that right. was said to me at church, not that that's a Mormon thing, you know, I, I'm not going to blame that on the Mormon right. church, but that was one of my earlier exposures to the races, uh, racism that was very much alive and well in the Mormon church. And that would have been, goodness, early, mid, 2000, no, I wouldn't even give it that year. Um, it, but okay. what we'll say, I, I mean, I got pregnant with Hayden in, in 06 and pregnant with Landon in 2010, yeah. but I mean, honestly, y'all, I got pregnant 11 times and delivered three babies. So there was a lot of infertility treatment, a lot of OBGYNs in there. Um, so anyway, I, uh, then I started my master's degree. So I started my master's program in 2009 when we moved to North Carolina. And when we started to study racism and the implications of racism in the behavioral health and the counseling field, I got introduced to a term that they call micro racism, where it's that, you know, I'm going to say that implicit bias where people are inadvertently doing things on a micro scale that are still racist so yeah they could we can share a bathroom now but they're still you know the last chose for certain things and and whatnot and that we as professionals in order to be competent providers we had to be aware of our own bias we had to be aware right. of that coming out right. as professionals and we also had to know how to treat that and work those who had been marginalized through those micro discrimination pieces. And it was about that time period that I became very aware of some of the things that were going on. And I was very grateful at that time. We were in North Carolina and I had two very good friends who were black. And one is Tammy. You know who you are, girl. Love ya. Woo woo. And Zuri. And I won't give Zuri a woo woo because she is a much more calm and reserved. Like Tammy is my <laughs> loud Southern. Zuri won't appreciate the woot woot as much. No, Zuri <laughs> won't appreciate the woot woot. Zuri is very much the deep thinker, calm, reserved person. And I love them both. They are still very good yeah. friends of mine today. Uh, I mean, Zuri was my first line editor actually for my book. She's who did all of my read throughs and edits and suggestions yeah. before it went to the publishing company. And so love these women to pieces. But in 2009, 2010, 2011, 12, 13, 14, so on and so forth, I began to have a lot more meaningful and conscious conversations with my black friends. And the closest people for me, the, the, the best friends I've ever had, and this continues to be even today, are the friends who can say, Sarah, that was really hurtful. Shut up. And we can still be friends. And yeah. Suri and Tammy were able to do that in their own personalities. Like, I remember Tammy, she'd be like, whoa, girl, you're rubbing my black wrong right now. Like, and we, <laughs> you can see her saying that, can't you? Totally. <laughs> love totally. her. Love her. No, her husband. How else do you bring awareness? Right. Well, yeah. and, and Squirrel. So here's a funny story. Tammy's husband was our home teacher. And Mason, you were on some TDY, something or other. I was pregnant with Landon. Tammy made Landon racist, y'all. Tammy, if you are <laughs> listening to this, I blame you still. Um, but anyway, um, I was super pregnant. And um, my home teacher's brother, <laughs> brother Tammy's husband, I don't, Ricky. <laughs> so Ricky... Um, was my home teacher. And so Ricky brought the missionaries to our home for, you know, dinner with the missionaries. I could be home taught because they're now three deep, he, three right. deep, right. whatever. He can give me my home teaching message. The missionaries can get fed two birds, one stone. I am like eight months pregnant, y'all, <laughs> with my 
last biological child and I am literally laboring hard. I am having false labor on our red lounge chair in our living room in North Carolina. And I'm like, oh, mm. you know, I mean, I'm hurting. You're TDY. I'm like, I got to hold this baby in. And the missionary is giving his spiritual thought and he is going on and on <laughs> And on, and we're 45 minutes in, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. I got to lay down. I got to put my feet up. Like, I got to take pills. I got to do something. I'm about ready to have this baby right here, and it's too freaking early. I'd probably been about 34, 35, so maybe more like seven months pregnant. And Ricky finally turns to the missionary and goes, dude, you got to shut up now. (laughs) 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 She's going to have a baby here if you keep talking. (laughs) And then he looked at me and he goes, you need me to get you to the hospital? I can get you there in about five minutes. And I'm like, dude, it's like a 20-minute drive. He's like, it don't matter. I can get you there in five minutes. I will get you there. I will hold your hand. (laughs) Tammy will come take care of your babies. And I was like, no, I think I just need to lay down. And he's like, all right, I'm going to come check in on you. And he did. He came back later um, with Tammy to check on me after I was able to lay down and get the pressure off. I was like, no, I'm good. I took my pill. It's calmed down. They're just heavy Braxton Hicks. I'm not allowed to have a baby while Mason's TDY, but <laughs> Tammy and Ricky. <laughs> love them. Love, love you yeah. for freaking ever. Yeah. Some of my best friends. And I am so unbelievably grateful for the conversations that we had that were very candid and very yeah. real And they started, they felt comfortable, and I would say they still feel comfortable calling me out when my implicit bias shows up. And I love them for it. I think that's why the uncomfortable conversations with a black man are so incredibly helpful and valuable is because they're candid and... They're real. They're real. Yeah, they, they address the real issues in a way... That is a little uncomfortable, but so valuable. Wait, so you're saying his title, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black... Very apropos, yeah. Great. No, Emmanuel (laughs) is one of my heroes for being able to truly and eloquently talk about the issues in such an open and friendly and approachable way. Absolutely. Alrighty, so fast forward, Mason and I, after we have our youngest Landon, um, I don't know what the hell went through my brain. But I was like, dude, we're not done having babies. And of course, we're Mormons. So big, huge families are absolutely necessary. We've got five kids at this time, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to adopt. And so we contact an adoption agency. And what do we find out from our adoption agency? Oh, well, lots of things. But I think (laughs) the thing you're referring to is that if you put on your paperwork that you're willing to adopt a black baby, you usually will get matched infinitely faster. Oh, yeah. It's like a 9 to 12 month wait list for a white baby and a couple weeks for a black baby. The other thing we learned was that to adopt a black baby was about $5,000 less expensive than to adopt a white baby. I don't remember that part. Yeah. It was was less expensive to adopt a black baby. So if our baby was black, it was cheaper for us. And so we, of course, put on our paperwork that we were willing to to adopt a black baby, not because it was cheaper or a faster wait time, but because honestly, we didn't have, yeah, we didn't have a preference. I mean, at this point we've got a Hispanic baby, a biracial baby, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter to us. That part didn't matter. And if you know our family at all, we obviously adopted a black baby because she is (laughs) very loudly black and we love her to pieces. (laughs) But this is where the church's ongoing racism really starts to bother me. So we adopt Abigail, and again, we're in a military ward. And I don't know, every military ward, maybe this is every ward, but every military ward, you've got a handful of baby whispers. So we're <laughs> in a ward with baby whispers, and this individual had held my other babies, um, my biological babies that are very, very white. Okay, so Mason's and my biological babies, they're snowmen, okay? We're, we are very, very white. And very fair-skinned, white, dark hair, fair skin. And then we've got <laughs> Abby, who is very mocha, and, and we just love her. And I've got, you know, I'm in the lobby 
of the church and my kids are doing something and Briggs probably throwing a tantrum down the hallway knowing me and Abby is in my arms and she's starting to fuss and I need two hands to wrangle kids in. Mason, you're in the bishopric at this point. And so I'm I'm doing mama of six kids pretty much by myself because Mason, you're running, you know, around doing leadership stuff. And so I ask Sister Baby Whisper, one of them, there were several in the ward, and I definitely don't want to call and hurt anybody, anybody's feelings, but I said, hey, can you hold Abby for a minute so I can go get my kids? And she took a step backwards, held her hands up like she was protecting herself and said, I'm sorry, I, I just, I can't. That makes me really uncomfortable. And I was so confused. Um... Because I've never, I had never seen that individual turn a baby away ever. And she went on, like, I, I figured it out eventually. It was because Abby was black. Yeah. Because Abby's my only baby that she would not interact with in any way. And that, that was really hard for me. And, and you know, I get it. Everybody comes from a different place. Um, and I don't want to judge this individual. And the things that this individual had done for our family prior to that time period were... Yeah. Incredible She's a very good and person. loving, good person. Yeah. But but that's that that first like slap in the face for me where the racism in the church suddenly matters to me, a white woman, on a whole right. new it's, level. It's finally become personal. Oh, it's very yeah. personal. And not that everybody has to have it be personal in order to make changes. But it sure makes a big difference. It sure catapults the change when yeah. it becomes personal. Right. At that point, I thought I was doing enough. But I don't think I truly was aware of just how much it existed still. Because it was never, yeah. it was never oh, aimed no, at I me. Didn't. I had no idea. Yeah. So some experience. And it wasn't just in the church. Again, this is in the community. I, uh, Abby would have been about three years old. We're playing at the park. She's barefoot. Abby never wears shoes, not even today when she's nine. Um, I get notes <laughs> home from her teacher sometimes. Abby wouldn't keep her shoes on today. And I'm like, well, at least her feet are clean. <laughs> and we just move on, right? But I remember Abby being three and we were at the park and this lady sits down next to me. She's a complete stranger. I have no idea who this lady is or was. And she's watching my kids run up and down and Abby's running up and down. And she goes, oh, I just hate black people who don't kick care of their kids where is that girl's mother look at her she is filthy and she is dirty and I'm like um she had a bath this morning ma'am and that is my daughter and it was like Oop. and she very quickly gathered up her children and left the park um other other areas that I saw this in the health community um is that Abby had been really really fussy and I had her to the doctor several times I'm um, trying to figure it out. And I kept saying, I think she's got an ear infection. I think she's got an ear infection. And if you're part of the military, you rarely see the same provider twice for your primary care provider. It just, you just yeah. don't. It, it, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And we had been to, she, you know, we'd been to urgent care and of course the ER because in the military, if the primary care doctor is booked, the culture was, well, just go to the ER. I used to, I started calling military ERs the predicament room. Um, again, funny story. Some of Mason's siblings have actually blamed me for being overdramatic and going to the emergency room for, you know, common colds and, you know, minor life infections. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's because that was the only place I could get care in the military. Not mm -hmm. because I thought it was an emergency, right. but because that was, the, I mean, before the military approved urgent care, if the clinic was full, you went to the emergency room and they yeah. had to have an urgent care doc in charge of it because it was absolute insanity that I'm in the emergency room for what I know is an ear infection. Right. But two doctors missed it and uh, they missed the ear infection. And so when I got to the third doctor, um, he looked in Abby's ears and he's like, oh, she's got a raging, raging ear infection here. And I was like, well, the other two doctors said no, and it was that doctor that explained to me, you need to make sure, because your baby is black, you need to make sure that you're seeing a pediatrician who is culturally competent because the membranes in black ears can look different because of the pigmentation in yep. there. And so it is harder to see an ear infection, and especially because Abby has microcephaly and her ear canals are itty itty bitty because her head is so much smaller he was like it's really hard 
to see. And so you need to make sure that you are seeing doctors who are culturally competent in that way. And, and then of course he's like, good job mama on, you know, being forceful and, you know, making sure not, not rude at that point. I wasn't rude anymore, but, but for me to be like, no, I need a second opinion. Get me another opinion. Get another, <laughs> for me, you could hear me get, an, get me another damn doctor in here because I need a second opinion. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't as polite as I thought. I was. <laughs> <clears throat> so you're polite as long as polite is accomplishing what needs to happen. Right. And then once you find that it's not, then sometimes you'll make that step right. into, I'm going to fight a little mm -hmm. harder. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is that when Abby was really little, I fought the overt racism that we were seeing in the church and some of the micro racism, that implicit bias. I just, you know, I fought it by being verbal and being like, hey, that's yep. kind of rude. And, and I remember, so when we were in North Carolina, we had a black bishop um, who I absolutely love. And I mean, if you're listening to this bishop, I'm sorry for some of the stupid shit I said in your office. <laughs> that was me trying to demonstrate to you that I was not racist because I kind of went from one end of the spectrum to the other. So I was challenging my implicit bias by being stupid and saying some stupid stuff. Um, and gratefully, he was so patient and kind to me. Just love that man. But his wife, Bernice, pulled me aside one day. So anybody who knows Abigail knows that she is an incredibly busy child. And she came out of the womb busy. Like, she, she, just crazy. And she can climb and dangle and acrobat like crazy. And I remember being in the foyer again of the church. I spent a lot of time in the foyer of that <laughs> building because Mason was in leadership. And I was in leadership at the time as well. Well, not with not with that bishop, but with previous bishop I had been in in leadership at that point I was teaching seminary. Um, but so I was in the, I was in the foyer and I had been braiding Abby's hair and put, you know, put in pigtails in and whatnot. And she like squirmed away from me and went to climb. So I was like, Oh, come here, you little monkey. And I will love Bernice to my dying day because she said, Hey, sister Westbrook, can I talk to you? And I was all, yeah. And she goes, how about in this, you know, classroom over here? It's empty. And I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. And she pulled me aside and she said, look, I know that you're saying you're calling your daughter a monkey just because she's climbing and you mean no harm by it but I want you to know that in our culture and in our in our community that is an incredibly hateful hurtful and racist thing to say and I don't want you to you know hurt your daughter I don't want your daughter to find out that that you've been calling her that and for me I was oh I was shocked and I said oh my gosh I had no idea. And then it was like, click, click, click right into place. You don't say things like that. Yeah. So that's when we started saying she was an acrobat instead of right. calling her a monkey because right. we didn't want to harm our daughter. And so once again, I want to just reiterate and reinforce to Bernice, to Zuri, to Tammy, thank you. Yeah. Because honestly, your direct bluntness in a very loving and kind manner, like their love for me didn't change, which made it a lot easier for me to grow the F up. Yeah. It really did. And to accept the things like you don't have, that's the very definition of implicit bias, right? You don't have to mean to be racist right. to still be racist to say things stuff, right. that are hurtful in a, from a racist perspective. And if you don't know it, you don't fix it. Right. And so if we can talk about it, then we can we can learn well, and we it, can grow. It's the same thing with with the whole unpacking Mormonism thing, right? There's mm -hmm. things that you're talking about that don't bother or affect other people and so they've never really thought about it. Until we talk about it, till you right. become until aware talks of it, about it. Right. You don't know and you can't fix it until you know. Right. You can't fix what you don't know. Well yeah. and and this isn't just about black and white. Like No, not at all. In in my family, my dad will tell really rude jokes about illegals, about Mexicans, about swimming Women. across the border. Oh gosh, we won't even go into that. We'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> but I but have yeah. I have a child who's Mexican. Yeah. I mean, and my child has not appreciated some of the things his grandpa has said to him. Yep. He's like, dude, that's you're talking about me. Oh, I'm not talking about you. You're not like that. These other ones. And he's like, you're talking about right. my birth family. You're right. talking about my heritage. Like I may be raised in a white family, but don't bag on my right. 
culture. Don't bag on my heritage. That's not okay. And one of the things our oldest struggled with when he entered high school, so at this point we're in Killeen, Texas, is that freshman year of high school, he was terrified to bring his black and Mexican friends home because they were afraid of the racial discrimination that they had experienced. Right. And we had to sit down with Eric and say, Eric, do you feel that dad and I are the way that your friends are describing? Are we one of quote unquote, those white people? They're going to think your friends are these horrible people. He's like, Oh, you know, well, one of them smokes weed. And I'm like, and when does that, when will that stop me from loving them? Like when? And he was like, Oh, it wouldn't. And it took Eric a little while to bring his yeah. friends home. And I'm going to tell you, Mrs. Coker, if you're out there, <laughs> your son is part mine because those two boys are brothers and will be brothers for ever. Like yeah. they love each other. I mean, there are people out there who I love. And Mrs. Coker, it's not your son smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> Just clar- clarifying that one. Not your son. Um <laughs> Sorry, Cokes. <laughs> I'm going to get shot today. Um, so anyway, but it took Eric a little while to be able to say, hey, you know, yes, I'm adopted. My parents don't look like me. My parents are white. They don't say that kind of stuff. Right. And if they do, you can call them out on it. You can be like, hey, Miss Westbrook, that hurt my feelings. And she's going to be like, yeah. Oh, shoot, can I bake you a pie? <laughs> They're teenage boys. I feed them to feel better. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So as we moved around the country, in, in Colleen, Texas, I don't feel like we ran into the same racism issues that we had in North Carolina with Abby at all. No, I don't think really. so. Yeah, I just I, I don't feel like we did in Colleen as much. And the benefit for Abby was she went to school. There was enough exposure to ethnicity and other races in our number one in our little Comanche two neighborhood. Like I think our little cul-de-sac had every ethnicity represented. We had Asian, Irish, black, German, white, redheads, yeah, Hispanic. Like we had Yeah, we like, had just about everybody. Just about everybody yeah. right there on our street. And our kids would go out and play and it was wonderful. And so if there was that racism going on in church, it was well balanced by the military community. But yeah, I, with the exception of our of our ward in North Carolina with Abby, we really didn't run into it in Texas, in, in, in our ward in Colleen at all. And then we moved to North Carolina, or I'm sorry, not North Carolina, to Missouri. And where we live in Missouri right now, we live in a very primarily white community. Yeah. And once again, a very white ward. And at this point in my life, I'm really struggling. Like this is, you know, we've moved to Missouri. I'm here without Mason. I'm struggling with my testimony. I no longer want to go to heaven because I don't want to do polygamy. Like things are beginning to crumble for me. And once again the racism issues are coming out of the woodworks, both in the community. Like we've like for the first time in years, we've got little kids at school making fun of my daughter because of her skin color and shout out to my children's schools. They have zero tolerance. They handled it beautifully. The teachers have handled it beautifully. Like we have no complaints on that at all, but it has become a part of Abigail's reality again, because she is a minority in this community and it and she's now old enough you know before she was young enough that when it happened she wasn't aware that it was happening and I could buffer it but now we're past that age now she's you know seven six seven eight nine um and she's not a dummy that kid is a pretty smart little girl and suddenly I'm struggling with the fact that I don't want my daughter to grow up in a religious organization that supports racism. And after I saw the CES letter, and we're going to talk about where the historical issues within the church started to influence my decision to leave, because that actually, for me, I left, and then the historical issues 
came up for me. Um, but once I started to get exposed to the CES letter, which Mason, we've got to put that in the show notes, and also the letter for my wife or letter to my wife that was written, I decided I wanted to know where the racism in the church was coming from. And I found ex-Mormon Reddit and a plethora of disgusting quotes about as black people become more righteous, their skin will get lighter, um, about blacks not being as valiant in the pre-existence. Um, I already knew about the curse and the, you know, the darkening of the skin because of the they were bad and, you know, whatever. For me, I'm like, all right, fine. Her ancestors may have been cursed, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with her. But once I started to read that the church prophets, seers, and revelators of the church taught for generations and more than one, several of them taught that blacks were less valiant in the pre-existence. I'm looking at my daughter, and there is nothing about that girl that is less valiant, less valuable, and I can no longer support a religious organization that was, what, a decade behind the civil rights movement in allowing equal rights, two, almost, two, two. almost two decades behind the civil rights yeah. movement, allowing blacks the same privileges and rights in their religious ceremonies and their temple yeah. rituals, access to the priesthood with absolutely no apology. How do I explain this to my daughter without breaking a piece of her soul? Yeah. And I'm here to tell you, you can't. You cannot. I 100% believe that all of that doctrine is utter bullshit. Um, and I'm really disgusted that today's church cannot come out and say they were wrong. They were influenced by their time, and that did not come from God. But they can't. They won't. We've called them to it now for what, since the late 70s? Was it 1978 when the... 78 is when the policy changed. When the priesthood ban changed. And mm -hmm. so then after that, I mean, it's not like blacks could suddenly flood the temples. There, there's still piece by piece different things lining up in the policies and the procedures. It's not like it was eliminated and all, it was a you know free for all, everything's equal well, now. It's like Emmanuel talks about you can't start... Uh, an entire population 500 meters behind everybody else and expect them yeah. to be caught up as soon as you remove the restriction. Yeah. There's no accountability for it. Well, and, and there was no fight. Like if you look at the civil rights movement, there was a fight. There was against a struggle. It. There was mm -hmm. there and on both sides, right? There was fighting against equalization of the races and there was fighting for, um, in the church, there was nothing. There was simply, mm -mm. here's the policy. Here's the change. And no talking about it, no nothing. You're, no, okay. I'm shaking my head. During the civil rights movement, there were quite a few talks um, by... Uh, okay, so don't quote me on this, but you're going to have to go back to a Mormonism live episode for the source material, and I, I would have to look that up to figure it out. But I know that they've done one. But there, I want to say McConkie and some other people, they were fighting against it and then okay. uh, was it tanner one of them marched i believe we had one religious leader march with martin luther king jr if i remember correctly but for the most part my understanding is the church during the civil rights movement they were 100 percent against it and then they shifted to being for it but with limitations which what the hell is that? That's like not that much change, right? Oh, yeah, you can have equal rights, except that's not equal. And even today, it's like, oh, well, they finally proved their righteousness, so the Lord finally let them have it. The curse has ended. And I'm like, that, uh-uh. Well, uh -uh. well and I, I would like to say that <sighs> if you look at it from a policy standpoint, there is complete equality in the church now. Like, Black men and women can can hold any calling, do anything that any other member of the church can do. I disagree. <laughs> Mason's sighing. Go ahead. You finish your thought, and then I'll explain why. Whereas in the world, there's still a lot of 
on paper equality, but not really equality in general. Now, I'm not saying that that means that there's not racism and discrimination going on. That's not what I mean. That still happens. Um, and, you know, for the most part, we're talking about the organization of the church, not the members. The organization, the policies of the organization, organization bleed down to the members, and there's certainly implicit bias there still. But in the equality exists but implicit bias will always get in the way of that really and truly playing out completely see and where i disagree with you is equality does not exist yes black members and white members can all go to the temple and receive the same ordinances and those types of things, but the representation of cultural diversity in the top leadership, um, especially for a worldwide church that's growing so rapidly in Africa, where are African leaders? Um, in who speaks in general conference? Like it was this last general conference that we had a black woman give a talk, first time, and it's 2022. Um, how many African Americans are in the Quorum of the Seventy? I'm aware of one. There's more, but I understand what you're saying. It's it's not equal. There is not equal representation. Not it, it's just for me. Maybe maybe people and and I think the challenge is, is that the church wants their membership to think everybody has an equal right. But if I look at leadership, if I look at who's in leadership callings. If, if I look at that, like our black bishop in North Carolina was rare, even in a, even in a community like North Carolina, where there is it, it, in, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where there's such a high population of black individuals within the leadership, look at that stake presidency, look at that quorum of, or not quorum of the 12, the, the high councilmen, look at the bishops, look at your young men's leaders, look at your young women's leaders, where are the black leaders? They were grossly underrepresented when you look at the membership in the congregation. And that tells me that there is still racism in the church and that I believe, I believe it's more than implicit bias. You may be right. There's no way for us to judge that, of course. I think that equality and equal representation are not the same thing but they are intricately connected. Um, and so, but we're not here to argue that either. We're here to talk about the, you know, what the struggles with racism are and how that led to you le leaving the church. Right. So, well, and, and I can say this and, and, and we can move on unless you want to respond to it. Of course, I don't want to shut you up, of course, but I don't believe that we can have true equality without equal representation. You know, I can't argue with that. I don't know if I completely agree with that, but I can't argue with it. It, it makes sense, and it certainly would go a long way to helping to overcome right. implicit bias. Um, you know, just the fact that, just look at Obama. You know, so many people voted for Obama strictly on the fact that he was a black, and it was the first time that we'd had a black president and um, I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but if that was not such a um, rare occurrence, it wouldn't happen. You know, if every other president was black or a woman or if 50% of the House of Representatives or 75% were black, we wouldn't have that same kind of like drought scarcity type thing like oh my gosh it's a black man running for president i have to vote for him i don't care what his policies are because i want to see that and i agree that we want to see that i'm just saying that if you had better representation like what you're talking about it would be w far easier to overcome the implicit bias that exists on a day-to-day -day basis with so much okay. so many of us so i'm going to challenge you again number one we're completely off topic for the purposes of this podcast, <laughs> but I would, f I feel obligated to speak out. What 
evidence do you have of people voting for Obama simply because he's black? I know that's what the media has said, but what data points do we have that support it? I think maybe some people sure did, but Obama, um, whether or not you agree with his politics, is very professional. He is very good at public speaking He was a qualified candidate, and he was black. I don't think the majority of people who voted for Obama voted for him because he was black. And I think that it is implicitly biased or implicitly racist to make that claim because Obama, whether, again, whether or not you agree with his politics, and on some things I agree with them, and on some things I don't. This is not a political podcast, but he was qualified. He was in politics for a long time. He was a very successful man in in many different ways. He was, to say that a lot of people voted for him because he was black is racist. And I think we need to back out of this because otherwise we're going really down a a wormhole that's not appropriate for the purposes of this podcast. But I want, I want to just reiterate that. So let me get this back into why I left the church is that I can't be in a church where my white brothers and sisters are talking about politics like this in front of my daughter, where she gets to listen to people debate and and talk about her value as a human being, her worthiness in the preexistence, which she can't even remember. And I can't have her going back and seeing me support men and women who said things like, if she lived righteously, her skin would get lighter colored and not have the church overtly, outwardly state Brigham Young was wrong. That was a false belief that did not come from God. And we are sorry for that. I can't raise a black daughter in a church that does not openly talk about their racist past, own it, and apologize for it so that my black brothers and sisters in that community have a voice where they can say things and be heard and be honored about our ugly history. If we can't talk about what's ugly, we can't fix it. So I think that this is an example of the very idea of implicit bias. I didn't mean at all to say that Obama had been elected because he was black. That's not what I meant to say at all. But I can understand that that's, that's, how, it was, that's how it was perceived or understood by probably many people. I really appreciate that clarification and your ability to own that. Um, on something that's going to be public is one of the things I truly admire about you the most Um, because that's a rare quality and I'm very grateful that you demonstrate that. Well, thank you. Um, We haven't even talked about my story, right? You know, I have my own implicit bias. I grew up in a place where there was We lived right next to an older black couple and there was one black kid in my school, (laughs) you know, so I have all the same, like, I don't, I don't feel racist when I went on my mission. I was around lots of blacks and Hispanics and all kinds of varieties of people. I, I don't ever remember feeling like they were lesser people or anything like that. Um, but you know, implicit bias there. I, I believe lots of things that are possibly implicitly racist and those are things that I want to be able to root out of myself as well um and so yeah we weren't we're not here to talk about racism in and of itself more how the church 
continues to perpetuate it, perpetuate it, or at least not actively try and stop it. At, the, at like, the very least, and from my perspective, that's kind of where I see it. It's not mm-hmm. so much that the church is racist. It's that they have a very strong history of racism and have done very little to nothing, in my opinion, to actively fight against that. Yeah. And so you can call that complacency. You can call it actively you know, putting on the blinders. Whatever works for you. In my opinion, it's simply that they have not done what they need to do to overcome the history that will affect people like my daughter, right. people like my friends. People like who, our son, who's biracial. Right. People mm-hmm. who might have an interest in coming into the church because of the good things that they offer, but will not because their church is historically very racist and that's what i want them to overcome for a good organization i still believe is a good organization and has some great things to offer they're not doing the things that they need to do to overcome some very very hurtful things i agree with that and i think that one of one of the challenges and one of the reasons why i came down on you a little bit hard there about the thing with obama is because that is a conversation that I have heard sure, in not, our right. strong right-wing conservative church. I mean, I would say the Republican Party is very well represented in the Mormon church. Um, and nothing against Republicans. Like, I'm not, right. we're here, not, not here to talk about politics yeah, right. or how we vote or, or any of those types of things. But the thinking that I'm seeing still in the congregation is that's a thing of the past let it go. Yeah. It doesn't matter anymore. Stop talking about it. And anytime you try and silence a voice, abuse is happening. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and racism is not the only thing that that happens on. Yeah. So absolutely. And we want to bring the voices out. Right. Right. We want to, we want people who say, let's not talk about it. Somehow come to the understanding and realization that it has to be talked Talked about. about. Um, That's what this is about. We're taking things out of the backpack that people don't want to talk about and saying, "This we've got to talk about this. We've got to work through this if we want to be healthier people, families, groups, individuals, church, whatever moniker you want, we've got to to do it. Right. Well, because, you know, we're both medical. Um, You cannot... Ignore an infection and expect it to go away. Very rarely will that happen. Right. You gotta treat it, you gotta drain it, right. you've got to clean it out. You cannot ignore it. And Mason, I would like to definitely add on to our follow-up. I want our audience to hear your story on these things. And so maybe over Christmas or spring break or something, we can do another mini series where we talk about some of the things that have value to you because I had forgotten about the black family that you grew up next to. And like one of the questions in my head is, did you play with their kids? Did you associate with them? Did you go over? Did you have them over for dinner? Did you interact with them? You know, I don't, I don't know. That's not something after 23 years of marriage, you have not talked about it. My story is so much less interesting. That is so not true. (laughs) We're going to, we're going to get there. So we will, go through Mason's story at some time in the future when he's ready and willing to share that with you. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for sticking this difficult topic out with us. Now it's your turn as a listener to take it and run with it and do something with it that's of of value in your life. Yes. Yeah. As always, if you have feedback, please feel free to email us at daisygirlcommunications at gmail.com. Uh, We love you, and we'll see you next time. Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma is hosted by me, Sarah Westbrook, and my husband, Mason Westbrook. Produced by Daisy Girl Communications and Alex Vidalis. Our music today was Moving Forward by Run to Life. And I Hope You Know by John Worthy Music.